you've seen the treatment of orbits from a circular motion standpoint, where the centripetal force results in a continual change in the direction of motion. This gives you circular motion. Another way to approach orbital motion is from a projectile standpoint. If you imagine a cannon firing in the absence of gravity or air resistance, what would the cannonball do? Exactly. It'll go in a straight line with a constant speed. But there is gravity. And on Earth, that causes an acceleration downward of 9.81 meters per second squared. Fun fact, down is not a universally recognized direction. If you're here, down is actually over here. What is universally recognized is towards the center of Earth. So its motion is going to deviate from that straight line by one half g t squared. After one second, the cannonball will find itself 4.9 meters lower than the straight line that it would have if there were no other forces. After the second second, it's 19.6 meters lower. And what you wind up with is that parabolic arc. If Earth were flat, the cannonball would always wind up hitting the Earth eventually. But if you have a launch velocity such that the downward deviation exactly matches the downward curve of Earth's surface, your cannonball would never hit. It turns out that Earth's surface curves downward 4.9 meters for every 7,900 meters across, like this. 4.9 meters is also how far an object will fall in one second. And that means that if you launch a cannon at 7,900 meters per second, it will fall at the same rate Earth curves out of the way. It's trying desperately to go towards the center, except that going towards the center keeps changing its direction. And then you hit yourself in the back of the head. Now, imagine that you ducked when that cannonball came around. It would simply keep going, trying always to fall to the ground, but never actually hitting. That's an orbit. And what that means is that the cannonball, as it orbits, would be in a state of free fall the entire time, just like an apple, as it's falling to the ground. What this also means is that any astronauts that are currently in the International Space Station are also in free fall all the time, 24-7. And when you're in free fall for that long, you get quite accustomed to things not hitting the ground. And there have been tales of astronauts coming back after six months in the International Space Station, picking up their shirts to get ready to get dressed, and then letting go because they fully expected to just sit there. And then they're in for quite a shock when they realize, hey, we're not in free fall anymore. Okay, so we've seen that Earth interacts with things like an apple and the moon, and that the acceleration resulting from that interaction is related to the square of the distance between them. The moon, which is 60 times farther away than a falling apple, has an acceleration that's a 3600th that of the falling apple. And we've also seen that the sun interacts with the planets in a similar fashion. As you get farther away from the sun, that acceleration diminishes as the square of the distance. Now let's figure out the final piece of the puzzle. The moon orbits at 0.00257 AU from Earth. We can work out in a pretty straightforward fashion that an object at this distance from the sun would experience an acceleration of 898 meters per second squared. But the moon experiences an acceleration of only 0.00272 meters per second squared. In fact, there's a factor of 330,000 difference in these numbers. So why? Well, as Newton found out, Kepler's laws, as determined by Kepler, were incomplete. It's true that p squared over a cubed is a constant, but that constant depends on the mass of your orbital system. The sun is 330,000 times more massive than Earth. So its effect on the motion of an object at a particular distance is going to be 330,000 times greater than the Earth's effect on the motion of an object at that same distance. Mathematically speaking, Newton reformulated Kepler's third law to include that mass of the system. And the equation became p squared times m divided by a cubed is a constant. And this particular version is true for any orbiting system. That constant 
is 4 pi squared over g, where g is the universal gravitation constant. Now focus on that word universal. Newton demonstrated that the force pulling an apple to the ground was the same one that kept the moon orbiting in, around Earth, and that is the same one that keeps the planets in orbit around the sun. It was truly a universal force. So, here on the surface of Earth, the force of gravity from Earth on you is simply your weight. And you could calculate that using the equation Fg equals big G, the gravitation constant, times your mass, times Earth's mass, divided by the separation between you and Earth, squared. But what is the force of gravity acting on Earth as a result of its interaction with you?